I'll show you some examples of how to use Affinity Photo's lighting filter. First, I'll add the filter to this background layer, which is the base image. Now, although I could find the lighting filter under the Filters menu, I'll go to Layer, New Live Filter Layer instead, to apply it non-destructively as a layer. By default, the filter adds an initial spotlight. Over the document view, I will immediately see several nodes that I can use to alter the lighting. The top node controls distance and azimuth, whereas the middle node will control azimuth and elevation. Increasing elevation by dragging it further towards the bottom node will increase the intensity of the light source. The bottom middle node controls overall positioning of the light source and the two bottom nodes either side will modify the inner cone angle or spread. Finally, the two outer bottom nodes will control the outer cone angle or spread. Although you can intuitively control these parameters directly on the document view with these nodes, you can also use the options on the dialog. For example, I could experiment with the distance slider, and I could also type values directly into the input boxes for more precise control, using Tab to move between the options. At the top, we have Diffuse, Specular, and Shininess sliders. To use these effectively, it helps to have a basic understanding of the terms. Collectively, they are known as lighting components. Diffuse lighting produces reflections independent of the viewing direction. This slider controls the contribution of the base color, which can be changed down here. Specular lighting describes the reflected light from a surface. The slider controls the specular intensity, and the color can be controlled with this option here. I'll change it to a light blue. Shininess controls the radius or scattering of the specular lighting. At lower values, the specular lighting is very small. When I increase the slider, it gradually spreads to the rest of the image. The ambient lighting can be thought of as the uniform background lighting. In this context, we would generally use it as the base lighting to ensure the image is not too dark. If I take away the ambient lighting completely, only the lighting from the light source remains. You can also change the ambient lighting color if you wish. I have the option of adding more light sources using either the Add or Copy buttons. The copy button will create a new light using the settings of the existing light. I can remove this and instead use the Add button, which will create a new light with the default settings. I'll drag the nodes and position this new light so it provides lighting for the path. Changing the light's color to red offsets the blue tone nicely and gives the image some extra depth. Because I chose the live filter layer version of this filter, I can close the dialog down for now but I retain the ability to edit the settings at any time. For example, I'll now explore the point light type. I'll show this light ring layer and set its blend mode to screen. I want this to blend convincingly, which means I may want to explore some different lighting options. I'll click on the live lighting layer thumbnail to reopen the filter dialog, and I'll click reset to return to the default settings. Down here, I'll change the light type to point. Immediately, I can see this is far more suitable for my requirements here. I can click drag to reposition this point light so it sits in the middle of the light ring. Now I can click on the color icon here and color pick one of the purple tones from the light ring. Then click here to assign it. To complete this effect, I'll also change the specular color. I'll color pick one of the blue tones from the light ring for this. I can use the shininess slider to control the spread of the specular color. Increasing it will illuminate more detail at the sides of the image. I can also increase the specular slider to heighten the specular intensity, creating a stronger glare effect. If I start to increase the ambient slider, I can gradually bring forth more contrast in the image detail. By experimenting with the balance between the ambient, specular, and shininess sliders, I can achieve more of a high contrast blend, as opposed to the more atmospheric, low contrast haze effect I had previously. The distance slider will control the overall size of the light. Reducing it will result in a smaller, focused light source, whereas increasing it will result in a larger light source that covers more of the image. 
If upon reflection I decided I preferred the low contrast, hazy look, I could quickly change these sliders. Then I can always toggle the lighting layer visibility to quickly preview the before and the after. Now I'll demonstrate the directional light type. I'll add a live lighting filter above the color balance adjustment layer and I'll change the light type to directional. This light affects lighting uniformly across the whole image. As well as click dragging the nodes on the document view, I can also use the elevation rotation input here. And of course I can type values directly into the input boxes as well. The directional light is most useful when combined with colors and blend modes. For example, I'll change the light color to a deep blue. Then I'll set the live filter's blend mode to lighten. This gives the darker tones in the image a strong blue tint. Altering the elevation will then control the intensity of this tint. Finally, I'll show you how to use the texture and bump map settings. I'll add a live lighting filter above the HSL shift adjustment, and I'll change the light type to directional modifying the elevation to make the image brighter. Now independent of the bump map settings, the texture slider can be used to add a textural effect to edge detail. I'll zoom in so the effect is easier to see. Increasing the slider strengthens the effect and using a negative slider value changes the direction of the effect. To start using the bump map settings, I'll reset the slider to zero and I'll click Load Bump Map. I can now browse to and select any type of image file. Typically, you will want to use a grayscale bump map, which is designed to add textural lighting detail to surfaces, but you can use normal maps as well or any type of image. I'll load this fingerprints texture. Initially, nothing will happen, but as I start to manipulate the texture slider, I will see the effect begin to appear. By default, the texture is scaled based on the bounds of the layer or document. I can uncheck both scale horizontally and vertically to fit, which will instead display the texture unscaled. If the texture is larger than the overall document resolution, only a portion of it will be used, with the origin being at the top left. I'll re-enable both options for now. The opacity slider can then be used to control the overall contribution of the bump map texture. Notice that as I do this, the original edge detect texture is revealed. If I don't want this blending effect, I can return the opacity to 100% and instead just use the texture slider to control the contribution of the bump map texture. I can also experiment with different bump map textures non-destructively by loading in different images. I'll try this wavy texture normal map, for example. Unchecking both scale options. Then close the dialog for now. As I've mentioned previously, I can always revisit the filter settings at any time by clicking on the layer thumbnail here. I can also control the overall lighting effect by altering the layer opacity. This can sometimes provide a more suitable blending result rather than using the sliders on the filter dialog. And there we go. That was a look at the lighting filter in Affinity Photo. I hope this video has been helpful, and thank you for watching.